Welcome to the final episode of our epic Steam adventure. Today we are visiting the spectacular Age of Steam Roundhouse in Sugar Creek, Ohio. But I have a confession. Because this place is so amazing, I thought it would be a fitting finale to this series. However, it was actually the first stop on our trip. Carson and I visited the day after arriving in Pittsburgh, before Chris joined us. The airline had lost my luggage, so I didn't have my good camera or even a change of clothes. But we made the trip anyway. A big thank you to Chief Mechanical Officer Tim Spazzato for taking the time out of his day to show us around. Hi, I'm Eric, and welcome to my channel. What's it about? Well, pretty much whatever I want. I've always been a photographer, and with this channel I have a new outlet to showcase those images I've collected over the years and are still collecting. My goal? To take things I'm interested in and share them with all of you. You might find yourself going to a place you've never heard of or learning about something you never understood. So stick with me, and you never know what's coming up next. This facility is truly amazing and was created due to the dedication of a very special, unique individual, Jerry Joe Jacobson. Jerry was an anesthesiologist with a passion for trains, especially steam locomotives. In 1984, Jerry began his career in the railway industry when he purchased his first railroad. For the next 26 years, he would continue to grow a regional freight railroad network in eastern Ohio, known as the Ohio Central while also building a collection of historic steam locomotives, classic diesels, and nostalgic passenger cars, and occasionally operating passenger excursions. Jerry sold the Ohio Central in 2008, which provided the capital funding needed to construct this incredible facility outside Sugar Creek. Completed in 2010, the roundhouse, shop facilities, and grounds have the feel of an early 1900 steam maintenance facility, but with all the modern conveniences. Jerry's incredible collection of steam locomotives is housed completely inside. Jerry Joe Jacobson passed away in 2017 but left a financial endowment and a capable team of dedicated individuals to continue his legacy. The Age of Steam Roundhouse is open for guided tours on weekends and special events occasionally throughout the year. Of course, the centerpiece of any roundhouse is the turntable. And so your power comes in overhead. You've got these guys right there. So to lock it in place, your motors are down there. Here's the operator's shack. Probably control right there to control it left and right. And that's probably the locking lever, the big lever. Pretty cool. This unusual locomotive here is what's known as a Camelback. It was built in 1903 for the Reading Railroad. The Camelback design was developed by John Wooten so that the locomotive could burn a much cheaper type of coal known as anthracite. Because the anthracite burns much slower than traditional bituminous coal, the firebox needed to be wider and shallower so it could have a larger grade area. With this, the cab could no longer fit in the traditional place above the firebox, so it was moved farther forward. 
This put the engineer in a cramped space astride the boiler, while the fireman stayed back on the gangway to shovel coal. The 1187 was purchased in 1962 by the Strasburg Railroad and ran there under its own power. However, they deemed it too small for their operation and only used it about five years. Age of Steam purchased the locomotive and moved it to the roundhouse in 2020. It's now undergoing a cosmetic restoration. So the engineer would be on the other side to run it, so there must be a throttle linkage that comes down. Yeah, you'll see it on the other side there. You'll... But then the, would the fireman do anything here? No, both injectors are on the engineer side and everything. Oh, so the engineer does all the injection. That is... Power, that's not a power reverse. Yeah, yeah, the steel mill added that. No kidding. Oh, yeah, it sure is, huh? Yeah, yeah the steel mill put that on. Oh, yeah, he's there. So, yeah, you got water glasses, you got tricocks, injectors. Oh, oh yeah, here's the cab right here, huh? Yeah, and, a, right and a throttle in the dome. Look at that. I'll be darned. Huh. Mm -hmm. Smells like fresh paint. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Windows. Buffalo, Rochester, and Pittsburgh number 152 is a 060 switcher built by Alco in 1904. While it's certainly a cute little engine, it's this unusual cylinder casting that has focused our attention. The steam for the branch pipe has got to come down through the saddle. So the steam for your, your branch pipe, mm -hmm. how does your branch pipe run? There's nothing here and your valves it's, are here. It's, yeah, it's all internal. And then It's in here, it's behind here. And then the, well, and then out to the exhaust. It's, it's the same thing. It's got a separate passageway as well. It's a heck of an intricate casting. Yes, it is. Yeah. Nickel Plate 763 was built by the Lima Locomotive Works in 1944. The 284 Berkshire type inaugurated the idea of locomotive superpower using a larger firebox to increase steaming capacity. Hugely popular by the Nickel Plate, the Berks remained on the active roster until 1960. Six of them survived with 763 being preserved in Roanoke, Virginia under the care of the Virginia Museum of Transportation. Having grown up in northern Ohio, Jerry had a soft spot for the epitome of nickel plate steam power, and he was able to finally acquire the 763 from Roanoke in 2007. I mean, it looks pretty nice sitting in here. Yeah, we cleaned it up, like I said, just for display purposes. And... Oh, yeah. But when you got, you know, these two big engines sitting next to each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of my regrets in life is I didn't get to see the 6325 run. Mm, yeah, it was a good engine. We had a lot of fun with it for a little shorter time than we had. It did real well. The 6325 is an Alco product of 1942, built for the Grand Trunk Western. This locomotive pulled President Truman's campaign train in 1948, which led to its being deemed worth preservation. In 1959, it was put on display in Battle Creek, Michigan. I recall former Grand Canyon Railway CMO of Robert Franzen recalling that GCR considered purchasing 6325 instead of the 4960. However, Jerry purchased the local in 1993 and restored it to operation, pulling fan trips on the Ohio Central from 2001 to 2005. Zart said my jaw would drop when I walked in here, and he's, he wasn't kidding. Now we got, um, now got the structure and everything, but we also got radiant floor heat in here. Oh, no way. Yeah. So we keep the chair. Electric, or does it have a, a cool... Water. Yes. Uh -huh. yes, water circulating. And then where's the... Uh, you have a boiler for it? Yeah, it's up in that little... Just a hot water, big hot water heater? Yeah, two of them. Now, this one, when you were running excursions out of Sugar Creek or Denison or something, didn't you run way yeah, back? This, this ran out of Denison. Oh, this is the two... Yeah. This is the 280 you were talking about, maybe running... A, this Alco 1920 product is most famous for operating on the Buffalo Creek in Gawley in West Virginia as their number 13. Jerry purchased it in 1993. One thing I'm surprised, I'm not, I mean, I'm used to the other side of the state of Ohio. I'm from Cincinnati originally. Um, I've never really spent time on this side and I was expecting more flat. It's got, you know, oh, more yeah. hills and... We're, yeah, we're in the better part of Ohio, as I yeah. tell people. Yeah. We're in the rolling hills area. Uh-huh. Yeah. Pretty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah it is pretty. Yeah. It's definitely nice to be here. Oh, Dad, it's a one-person thing. Everything on the bottom looks like. Mmm. I mean, like, there's a few valves. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. Um, you... Like, there's a few valves, but there's no injector on the fireman's side. See? 
No, the injector's right there. Oh, it's a different yeah, type so, of injector. Yeah, it's a lifting injector. But you could run it with one person. Well, somebody's got to shovel. Just stood right there. Somebody's got to shovel coal in the firebox, or that's an oil burner. It's a tank engine. Where's the oil? Dad, it's a tank engine. It's a tank engine. Where's the oil valve? Where's the oil tank? What do you mean? Where's the oil? It, this the steel mill. This came from the steel mill. Uh huh. And they put a tender on this thing. I got the tender buried over here. Oh, Little gotcha. Homemade tender. So gotcha. So it, it has a saddle tank. Originally, it had a wooden cab and had coal lockers in the back. But the steel mill converted it to oil. And they got rid of the lockers, put a steel cab on it. You know what you could do? And, um, you know, had the tender with the tank in it. It was just a four wheel tender. You know, you know what you could do? But where's the oil valve? Uh, I, don't th I think it was long gone. Oh. The burners are, you can see the burner down there, but. It was all missing, so we just left it this way for display. So the burner actually yeah. was on this end to shoot yeah. that way. That's why it's, it sloped up right. like that. Right. Well, that's goofy. Yeah. Well, that's on steel mill, guys. It was a one-man show. And somewhere they had a, probably the burner things on this side, the controls. And, yeah. Yeah, this was uh, 1897. This was built. Okay. Leo, these tank engines are kind of cute. Yeah, they are. So are, do you have many oil burners in the roundhouse in the collection? Um, yeah, the 282 in the back shop, it's oil. The, the one from Oregon. Yeah, and the 262 uh, is, uh, is oil. Um, this one's an oil. The Brooklyn Dock engine is oil. And that's it. Oh, cool. So we got four. That's cool. What? What's that off of? That is homemade. Okay. We had an extra door, a face plate. And um, when Jerry was young, this engine, the 417, was stationed in Akron. And he hung around out here all the time on his bike. And occasionally he'd come out as a backup. And uh, so we kind of doctored this thing up to, as a tribute to him. Okay. The engine got scrapped, obviously. It looks cool. There's not a whole lot of B&O engines still around, I don't yeah. think. None of them operational. No, no, not really. Uh -uh. And then the 1293 Pacific. Yeah. I've heard good things about this engine. Yeah, this was a good engine. I yeah, always enjoyed around this one more than almost all the other ones. It's just the right size. It's got the right pulling power. And it just... Lights are good, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah. A little more modern 48. That's a fairly late... Late yeah. build. Yeah, that one there would be. If we were to have to put a, a bigger road engine out for some reason, this would be the one. Well, we've done so much to it over the years. All we have to do is the 15 year again on it. We've kept everything else pretty well off the, up to snuff underneath. There wouldn't be really any running gear work. Is this one still current on its tubes? No. Do you have anything that's current other than the one? That's it, yeah. We only keep the one now, yeah. Okay. The rest of them are all retired. Yeah. Officially. Yeah, like, yeah. We'd have to do a 15 year, like for the 13, you know, the 280 runs, but we just have to do that one. All the way we And you've got the 33 in here, don't you? Yeah, it's coming up here. Yeah, I wanted to see that one because one of the Ellis and I collections, the one that I haven't seen. Mm -hmm. So the 1551. Yeah, that's 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 is that lunch time? Yeah. Lunch whistle. What whistle was that? And, uh, that's our lunch whistle. Shop whistle. Air power? Yep. And uh, yeah, we started doing a 15 year on this, and then he said, ah, oh, hold off on it, because he's selling the rest. So we never got around to finishing it. But. You know, this is another candidate if we were to get out on the main line or something between here and Sugar Creek, this would be ideal. Mm hmm Yeah, it's a nice proportioned engine for a small little flatland. Yeah, sure is. It's uh -huh. perfect. Yeah. Yeah, wall shirts, valve gear, mm -hmm. piston valves. Probably, is it superheated? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. power reverse. Yeah, not bad. Yeah, speed freedom. <clears throat> 
That's not a second sand dome. No, that's that's just a cap on top yeah, of a turret nice. or something. Yeah, that covers where the pops are. There's a <laughs> right. Okay. And is this the Gettysburg famous Gettysburg engine? Yeah. Wait, Gettysburg engine. Uh huh. So, 1993, five, 1995. This engine was running on a short line out of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and it suffered a crown sheet failure that killed two people. No, didn't kill them. No, they just injured them. D heavily the heavily injured. Engineer eventually died like ten years later with complications. He got it the worst. The other, okay. There was two firemen. One was okay, you know, minor burns. The other one was minor burns, but he when he jumped out of the cab, he broke a leg. Okay. Yeah, and then. Um, you know, the engineer, he, well, he was the owner's son. He survived it, but within, you know, by 10 years later, he passed on because he was just horribly burnt. You know. So, so severely injured, but nobody died directly no, at the accident. Right. But so what happened? Like, how did it crash? Can we go up and, can you see it into the cap? Not really, yeah. You can't see it? That, yeah. Okay. What do you mean a crown? Okay. It's, um, so yeah. the firebox, the top of the firebox is called the crown sheet. Okay, and it's held in place by stay bolts that provide strength to it from the boiler shell. Mm -hmm. So they low watered the engine. You have to have water over the top of the crown sheet at all times. Otherwise, the heat from the fire is so warm or so hot that it will cause the steel to start to deform, start to melt. Mm -hmm. So he had, um, so they had, were they problems with the water pump, the injector, or, uh, and then the water glasses were clogged up or blocked? So they, so they didn't realize that they were low on water. The water dropped low enough, so it was no longer protecting the crown sheet, so it wasn't covered with water. So then the fire caused the metal on the top of the crown sheet to deform, and it buckled, and then re caused a significant release of pressure. Um, th this one had a what's called a fusible plug, so that's a safety device. So it um, melts, so at a certain temperature, the fusible plug melts, and then it causes water and steam to go in and put the fire out and then but that also flows throws back in the cab so the engine crew there was an engineer and two firemen i think and they got burned from the steam that uh shot back in the cab but at least the boiler if you didn't have that fusible plug the boiler would typically explode and this thing goes flying for and hundreds of feet in the all of the freight and if it was a passenger train it was a passenger train it was a tourist train yeah so then in that case pretty much everybody in the first five train cars would have probably would have been injured pretty badly as well if well it would if it wasn't for the fusible plug if it had totally blown but now it just had a huge escape of steam which burned the engine crew but none of the passengers were hurt mm -hmm. <clears throat> so after this that led to the FRA changing steam locomotive regulations for tourist railroads, and they rewrote the entire boiler code. So the, the codes that we have to use now, the rules in order to run steam locomotives uh, under Federal Railroad Administration jurisdiction, were, came a large part due to changes because of this accident. So it was right after that they changed what, all the rules. What changes were those? Like can you just like name one, two specific? Well, the fifteen-year uh, boiler inspection is all result of that. Before that, you could they could go on just an annual. Yeah, that, yeah, but actually, the committee had already been in. They've been already working on working it. Stopped. They just stopped and went back and reviewed certain areas that uh, they had already addressed and changed them based on things the results of this one. Yeah. And then you had. And then you had to uh, you had, uh, go with two water glasses in the cab before you only had to have one water glass in. You could go with tricox. Now you have to have two water glasses. Um, because it clogged up. Mm -hmm. so yep, so you have to have a backup. Uh, yeah, more inspection procedures. I, mean, it, I think it's all good. I'm, I'm, I like the way the program is now for the most part. It's, it's workable. But yeah, this engine is, is famous for that reason. This little 260 was built in 1910 by the Canadian Locomotive Company for the Grand Trunk Western. F. Nelson Blount purchased it for a Steamtown USA collection. Jerry purchased it in 1994 after it was deemed surplus by Steamtown. Wheeling in Lake Erie number 3960 is a 060 switcher built by the railroad's own shops in Brewster, Ohio. Eventually becoming part of the nickel plate, its last service was in 1957 when it worked out of Zanesville, Ohio, just down the road from where we are today. 
All right, so here you're doing an ultrasound inspection, huh? Yeah, yeah but we're not actually, this is for uh, display purposes. We give this for two, on the tours, we, so we explain to people what you do. Now, this is another engine that, uh, oh, it's missing some parts because several groups tried to restore it. And we managed to salvage it before the part went the wrong direction in the pipe. And uh, we cleaned it up just to make a display engine for giving the uh, visitor an idea of what we're talking about. 15-year inspections, they can sort of see how it's laid out. And this is what you do for the 15-year inspection, is you strip it to this level, and then the, you do the grid, and then you measure the material thickness in each one of those squares. And then you do a bunch of math. And then do some math, mathematical calculations and determine the... Is it good or is it not good? Yep, safe? if it's safe to operate. And if it's not safe to operate, then it's permanently going to be out the depot. No, you can replace the boiler. You can, you can either repair the boiler or you can replace... The well, that's <laughs> that's the dilemma for preservation. If you replace the boiler, replacing fifty percent of the entire engine. That's the main part of the engine. So this is the LSNI thirty three. So so this is twenty nine's big sister. This came from the same row that eighteen and twenty nine came from. They had three classes in their later years. 18, the class 18, 19, 20, 20, 21, 22 were the smaller class. 29 was the middle class. And then 33, 34, and 35 were of the larger class. So kind of like the Bitcoin Challenger classes, but Yeah. <clears throat> this is a big consolidation. Big consolidation, yeah. yeah that's a big one. Huge. And the 734 of, at Western Maryland is the same. Mm -hmm. Stoke, so a Stoker engine, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. For your coal, coal auger. Oh, so it still runs on coal? Yeah, yep, still coal fired. So then 29 would have had a stoker as well. No, I don't think 29 did. I think 29 was always hand fired. I don't think it ever had a stoker. Oh, yeah, right, with how small it is. It's a little smaller. Kind of 29 did have a booster on the trailing truck, or on the, um, on the tender. Mm -hmm. And we still have the booster. We don't use it, um, but the booster is still floating around. Hmm? Yeah, unfortunately, the Hawking Valley people scrapped the booster and truck. Oh, so this one had a booster as well? Yeah, we wanted it, but they had scrapped it. They needed money, and, and um, yeah, those you just can't find. Right. Uh, yeah, if I found one that would work, I'd put it back underneath this thing, just keeping it, you know, original. So, set 26 over 30, 73,000 pounds of tractive effort? Uh, yeah, with the booster cut in, yeah. Oh, with the booster, okay. Oh, cool. Siphons. That's out of the 33. We replaced them up here, actually. Once we got the engine here, we, we replaced them. It's still got the same design? Yeah, Just okay. same thing. Just built new ones? Yeah. yeah. Why did you replace them? Were they thin? Yeah, yeah you can see a lot of it. XS, SX, XS welding and stuff on them. And, uh, they were, yeah. Yeah, there's they were, patches. They were new, so we just make it all new. Okay. So, must have replaced a lot of the firebox then, probably, huh? Uh, no, this is, uh, what, three, one, two, three, about four different engines worth of parts. Oh, okay, not all the same. same. For show and tell. Gotcha. Yeah. These are the coal grates, Carson. So oh, on a coal burn, that's nice they're upside down, but that's the you know it's like you know on a charcoal grill, but it's just a lot bigger, and you throw the coal on there, and the coal burns. So it just doesn't fall through the bottom. So. Mm -hmm. And air, and then the air comes up through the bottom in order to you know get the air to burn for the coal to burn. Which is why it runs smoother faster. Yes, yeah, because you the more air that flows through from your draft. And if you go too fast, then you lose too much pressure too quickly. That, if, but if you go too slow in your, in your, that's a lot to work out. I don't think I've ever realized that. Now I understand why you guys converted. Oh, there's a little bobber caboose. <gasps> bobber couples, zero. Another 060? Yeah, there's a local engine. Always lived here in Ohio. And guy bought it. And yeah. Used to run it up on his private property. It, it runs. We've had it run in here. Yeah, nice little engine. Yeah. Sturm and Dillard, number 105, was built by Baldwin in 1917. 
It worked for a construction company in Ohio before being purchased by Art Davis in 1969. He moved it to his property in Orville, Ohio, and Jerry was familiar with it there. After Art's passing, Age of Steam purchased it and moved it to Sugar Creek in 2015. Another 280. Yeah, this came from the Mid-Continent. Oh, from there? Yeah. yeah they never ran it. Just oh, it's a Decapod. It's a 210. Yeah, it was oh. a display engine. I think I've seen this at Mid-Continent. Yeah, yeah, it used to set up their mother station. Yep, I think I've seen it there. It looks a lot better here. They, they were disposing some of their collection, trying to make a little money and make some space. Yep, yeah, that's what it was. Yep. No, it looks good here. Alabama, Tennessee, and Northern number 401 was built in 1928 by Baldwin. Age of Steam moved it to Sugar Creek in 2015. Yeah, he cleaned up nice. Uh huh. Yeah. The bell. Yeah, that's that. The tour just came in there and started the tour. How long do the tours usually last? Hour and a half. Yeah. It's a bigger tank engine. Well, this one, this one up front, that's a fireless engine. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, pump in the hot, the superheated water. Yeah, this is it. This would just run around the yards. Yeah. Industrial plant. Uh-huh. Built by Heisler? Yes. Yeah, this one was. Interesting. Yeah. So there's the U.S. Navy one we were talking about earlier. And that, oh, oh, yeah, I see the resemblance to Thomas. Absolutely. So you said Strasburg's got one. Wow. Theirs is pretty similar. Their Thomas engine is, is like that. Yeah. It does look like Thomas. Yep. Changed the, you know, the modifications, obviously, but that's what it looked like originally. Yep. Top left corner would be cut off, and then other than that, it's like perfectly Thomas. Well, no, not exactly, if you really think about it, because okay. Thomas is an inside frame pistons. The pistons are inside the frame. Well, it's because it's British. Yes. So, in America, if Thomas was an American engine, then that would be Thomas. There you go. Because Thomas is not an American engine, Thomas is British. Which is why everything was killed by forming. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. <laughs> also, yep. what, what type of tank engine? This, this looks something out of Mad Max. Compressed air. Compressed air? On compressed air. Oh, yes. How far can it run on compressed air? Well, that's always a debate. We try to figure that out. It's, 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 our understanding is this thing ran, they actually had airlines in various locations on along the line. So they could stop anywhere and throw a charge to it. But uh, that's a good question. I knew Yeah. They never tried it. It takes 800 miles per square inch. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. What's this part for? Um, that's like a, a coolant for it because it keeps the frost from building up. It, it lets the ambient air in keep the frosting down because the tanks will start frosting and okay stuff from, you know when you use a lot of oxygen yep. from the bottle and uh -huh. ice up uh-huh yeah. yep that was the be interesting to see run like i said i've seen little ones run little models, and then we have you can you can pump it up to probably 200 psi or something yeah, just to putz it around and demonstrate it yeah that's been on our way down on our back burner because if, do you need FRA, if you're just running here in your shop, in your yard, you don't need a full yeah. FRA certification. No, it's like anything, you're not putting it in service. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you need, yeah, that's kind of the rules of it. Yeah. And you're not going out on the main line, you're just running it here on your own property, so you could count this as insular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so let's, this is an Army engine. Yeah, it used to, it spent its whole life at Fort Eustis. I was wondering. It was the Trinity engine. And then it ended up in um, Cass. And oh. Donated the Santa Cass for us. Okay. And then Franzen bought it from Cass. And, and we got it from Franzen. Okay. So it's probably similar to the 610 at TVRM? Real similar, yeah. There's a lot of similarities. They made them pretty close. And then, is there another ex Army engine? Floating around. Oh, there was one in Alaska. Yeah, yeah. There's one up there. And I got that one, but it's a different, slightly different model. That one, it's smoking out. Oh, right, 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 right. Yep, that's the other one I was that's thinking of. A little different model. 
<clears throat> well, you guys fixed it up pretty good. It looks good. Yeah, we use it. We do a World War II event here every year. It goes outside on display, and, and the reenactors are all here. So, you know. Neato. So, yeah, it comes out. It's pretty nice. Pretty nice little setup when you get it outside there. They close all their trucks and vehicles around it, and guys sitting around it. Yeah, pretty slick. It's a nice engine. It is a nice engine. I don't engine. think I've ever seen a steam engine painted in the camo green. So, yeah, this... It looks really good. So these engines were built with the idea of going overseas, operating overseas. Um, well, this one looks like it was built after World War II, but they had some that were built... That was built in World War II. It's what, 43? Oh, I thought it was an 8. Oh, okay, so 43. So it was built in World War II. Yeah. Um, 1949. So it was, you know, the... You know, engines over there and the railroads were getting bombed and tore up. The Americans, as they came in, they wanted to be able to have their own engines that they could run on their lines to be able to get things moving again. Hence the reinforced boiler. <clears throat> no, it's... It, lo it looks slightly reinforced. Like, that's, it's thicker... That's the jacketing. Oh. All with the insulation behind it. Oh. But notice how, notice how it's kind of squatty and it's not quite as tall and the cab is kind of squatty mm -hmm. because... Uh, Clearances in Europe are not as tall, so they had to make it a little bit shorter. And also, look at the, you have the protection on the windows. Like, the, the smaller windows, they're not actual doors. They're not big doors. But this engine never went overseas. It stayed here. It was a... Transport troops from hometowns to... Well, they used it at, at Fort... Where's Fort Eustis at? Uh, down near Virginia Beach. Okay. Virginia. So, that, so that's where they did their, they did training. They trained the guys, and so they would use this engine for the training before then they went overseas. Mm -hmm. And then had more engines like this overseas. <clears throat> but this is the one they kept here in the States. Yeah. And then several of those. So uh, I guess. Yeah, they're scattered around. Another <clears throat> one, the, well, the six. When Fort Eustis had, this is its original number, but then they changed, the Army changed the number, and it became 612. Oh, okay. And then, um, the sister engine to this, one of them, 610, is down at TVR. And I've ridden behind that engine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they got kind of got scattered. There's one still left over there. I forget its number. But it's on display at, at the uh, Transportation Museum at Fort Eustis. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's another one over there. <clears throat> and uh, that's a nice one. It's, it's all complete. It's been taken care of, so it, it looks good on display. It's an interesting place to put the air tank, but I guess when you're trying to cram things in, yep. in you do what you can. Yeah, they Pretty cool. So over here, Carson against the wall, these are tires in, your, in a ring of fire. Oh, <clears throat> so. I, I remember, uh, yeah. Ring of fire. Yeah, so that's your tire. And then, then they, they put that around it and then with uh, probably propane acetylene. Yeah. And then heat heat it up, and then push it onto the onto the rim. I remember was it Sacramento or Kilmer and Toltec? When I touched one, and I didn't know it was hot. It hurt my fingers. I was with mom. I was with mom. It was before Helen was born, but I was with mom, and you might have been doing something else. Was it Railtown? It was Railtown. Railtown? Yeah. Uh huh. Because they they set one up. I've seen it. They set one up and use it for display purposes. I didn't know that it was hot. For, for their like, tours I, like and I things. I touched it, and he said, be careful, it's hot. Right after I touched, touched it. it. Yeah, it's all you are, yeah, you never know. Yeah, yeah we can walk out this way. Cool. We went up to the back of the tour. And we'll, we'll because he said shop. tires, and I thought he was like... Appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, we're having a... This is this is really exciting. Good. Always been on my list to come here. Yeah, because he said... Made it. I am too. He said it was... As we walk outside towards the turntable, we can see the car shop building across the way, plus other equipment that is stored outside. All right, so this is that little diesel you said you use for, mm -hmm. yeah. for switching around the yard. Yeah. 
Uh, oh. Prairie. Okay. Yeah. Moguls are 260. Uh, uh, From the McLeod? Originally, yeah. This is the one that went up to uh, Steve Butler. Oh, this Steve is Butler's Butler. engine. Yeah. Okay, and it's an oil burner. Yep, Kettle Moraine. Right. Oh, this is the Kettle Moraine engine? Kettle Moraine engine, yeah. Okay. Or back to the Camelback. And your 060. How often do you fire this guy up? Oh, I don't know. A dozen times a year, probably. Yeah, we just had it running last weekend for two days. It seems uh, like, well, what, yeah, it seems like everybody had something going yeah. on for Father's Day. Everybody was posting stuff on social media. Yeah, we had, you saw a steep traction of engines out there. That's the guy I've come back from those last two. But that's what they're sitting out there for from that event. So we had you know, a little mixture of everything. There's plenty of cool smoke flying around. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Did you have a good crowd? Yeah, it was a pretty good turnout. Yeah, sold out all the tours, and a lot of people you know, came and rode the train. So that was nice, too. So, yeah, it worked out really well. So this is the back shop. Tour, yeah, tourists come from people always taking pictures. And, yeah. Oh, lathe. Yeah, it's a wheel lathe. That's a nice one. Yeah. We completely tore it down piece by piece and rebuilt it here. Do you have a quartering machine? Yeah, the one behind it. And you sort of see it back there. Okay. Same thing. We put that all down. So you just, are you fixing something or is this just a display? No, no, this was, uh, somebody saved this when the engine got scrapped. And then that and, would be um, the It used to have a wood huh? cab and everything with it, but when we got it, it, it was in derelict shape when the guy told me where it was. So we grabbed it for a display. It looked good for Oh, it's an awesome display. Yeah, that's really it awesome. Looks like, and then I laid out tools of the trade and different types of bolts and sleeves, caps, just so people can understand. Oh yeah. Doing. Oh yeah. yeah. No, this is this is very educational for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you get your flex flexible stay bolts, your rigid stay bolts. I need to put a boiler here. Crown bolts up there. Yep. Uh-huh. Braces, boiler braces. Yep. That would be no, for the no, turret. Yes, sir. Arch tubes or uh, arch brick. Yep, they kind of show them how it goes. Yeah. Uh huh. Sweet. That is really cool. Yeah. That is really, really it's neat. Real popular. People like seeing that. Well, you don't get to see. You go to most museums and you walk around and there's stuff parked. Mm -hmm. And then a little display sign talks about where it ran, you know, who built it. Yeah. You don't see the nuts and bolts. And that's something that museums are, yeah. are you know, uh, they're failing at these days. Yeah, so we're, we're happy we got it. Like I said, it works out. The rest good. of the engine's been scrapped? Yeah. That's, that's all that's left. Oh, yeah, it's cool. Way cool. Keyhole firebox. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And we're lucky somebody saved it all those years. And that's it kind of fell apart. And, you know, hey, it works. <coughs> so, so this is the 282. This is another McLeod engine? Yeah. Oh no, Oregon, you said. Um, Wairika Western. What? Okay, yeah. the Wairika uh, engine. Yeah. But they all were in the same area. It's, remember, this is the one they made the movie Emperor of the North with. This is the Emperor of the this North is engine. The main team, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we got it from the uh, Wairika Western when they got rid of it. That's so where we got it from. So this engine's got its own famous history. Mm hmm. <laughs> And it needed a lot of work, as you can see. Oh, yeah. No, you guys got it pretty well tore down. You got a lot of new parts in this one. A lot of new parts. But original boiler. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we got the boiler work done, except for the final installation of the tubes. But right. Yeah, you want to do that. Yeah. One of the last things. Right. Yeah, yeah so running gear. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like a lot of tramming going on. 
Yep. All new shoes and wedges. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, we actually had to make a couple new uh. binders. Okay. Because they were so worn and bent. And um, so we did we did quite a bit of work on it. The trailing truck we already did. That we did that first. It's done. But, uh, the trunk truck is real close to getting uh. finished to put back in. Probably have a couple of weeks to have that over there. Oh yeah, there there we go. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Soaker. No, it's superheated. Okay. Oh, that'll be a nice engine. Oh, there's the bands over there. All ready to go. Sweet. New yeah, that's what it looks like. Well, Tim will back me up. The old superheater units are about as thin as I've ever seen a set. They've been overused. Yeah. Completely out. Yeah. 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 Well, you, you made, so you order the stock and then you machine them? Yeah, we do our own machine. You do your own machine? Yeah, I would yeah, I would expect so. You've got plenty of tools for that. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, driving boxes. Yeah. That's for the nineteen. Oh, there's the old ones. So, do you, uh, these are all fabricated? No, cast. Cast? You had a cast? Yeah, we were cast, yeah. Oh, wow. Cheaper in the long run to try to fabricate it. Is the size common enough that you could use them on multiple engines, or are they pretty much specific to the 19? Pretty much specific. Yeah, they're. Yeah. Yeah, we had other boxes laying around that they weren't anywhere close to working, so we had to just go ahead and make new ones. Which is usually how it works. Nothing's ever easy. No, it isn't. When you're working on machines that are 100 years old, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Pistons? Yeah, those are new piston heads. We just made them. Sweet. Yeah. The new nuts for we just haven't secured everything completely yet. Getting close. Yeah, you are getting close. Yeah, a lot of work. Once we get the drivers back underneath, get her on her own weight again, then I can start slapping the parts on. Everything else above it is pretty much done. I mean, all the appliances, the piping, everything's just ready to bolt on. And that would be a good engine to go back and forth, mm -hmm. you know, a couple miles. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's going to be a good one. Yeah, oil-fired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you use for fuel. Just crankcase oil? Just crank well, yeah. That's what a lot of people are doing. We, there's a place right up here north of your kit. Uh, they deal in used oils. Uh huh. And, uh, yeah. I've talked with them and it's like, yeah, we, we got what you need. It's okay. And there's that. Consider vegetable oil? Yeah, some people are using that. We're using it. Yeah, are you? Uh huh. Yeah. It, it works good, but it's not, it, it is pricey. And yeah. supply is the critical thing. It's finding a supplier that can deliver it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's fairly expensive, unfortunately, but it does burn burn well. Yeah, you just have does. to preheat it. Yeah, it burns well and it burns fairly clean. It does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Compared to used oils. And the thing we like also is that if it leaks on the ground, nobody cares. Oh, that's true. Yeah. And especially when you're in the national park. Yeah. Yeah, that's important. You gotta go there. The animals come over and eat it. <laughs> oil? Yeah, the vegetable oil. The vegetable oil. Yeah, they yeah they'll that. come over and snack on it if yeah. if we drip it on the ground. We got the little manual crane in here, and then we got the little two ton out there over the big machinery. Wow! But, uh, yeah. All built brand new. Yeah. 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 And then what's is that? That's the ash hoist. Oh, Ash, got it, okay. You see the pit in the track, we uh -huh. open up the grates, and then the little skip car comes down. And yep. Take the ash out. Just like they would have done it years ago. Yeah, we just don't take the dump car out and dump it on the main line like 
Yeah, real similar. Ah, blue signal protection. Excellent. So, this building is what, That's just oil house. oil house lubricants? Yeah, we use it as an oil house. Uh huh. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we should. We will. Oh, there's a little skip car. Yeah. And that all works? Yeah. The skip so car all cool. Yeah. No way. Really? Yep. Yeah, we just used it the other day. So when you run your little, you know, excursions around the shop, you have, what, a couple cars? Yeah. Just a couple cars there. We use those two and board at the station, pull down to the gate, and then we take them back to the turntable. Yeah. Just got to... Give them a little taste of being on board. So cool. And now it's that part of the program where we count how many steam locomotives we saw today. So that brings our total steam locomotive count for today to 22, which brings our trip total so far at 119 steam locomotives. Well, I'm glad you joined us for our visit to the amazing Age of Steam Roundhouse, but guess what? I'm going to tack on a few more episodes of bonus content. On our way back to Pittsburgh, we're stopping at the Denison Railroad Depot Museum in Denison, Ohio. This place was quite the surprise, and I can't wait to share it with you. And as an extra bonus, there's another locomotive in the Age of Steam collection that is not in Sugar Creek, and I really want to see. So we're going to take a look at that as well. Come back and join us.